Thank you for joining us for another podcast from Bryce Canyon Bible Church. I delight in you, Lord Jesus Christ. We are located next to Bryce Canyon National Park in Tropic, Utah. Now for the message. Crosswords, the seven excruciating statements of Jesus from the cross. In today's message, victorious over death. And here we go now through the seven statements we've looked at. And today I want to read through them. The first one we looked at, these are the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross just before he perished there on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Now, the the last one today, and this is in the order in which he spoke them, by the way. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, 46. And before you turn to that passage, let's go to the teachings of Christ while he was yet alive here. And this is from John 10, 6 through 21. Let's turn together. John 10, 6 through 21. If you don't have a Bible, we have pew Bibles that are right there before you that you're welcome to use. I love for, pe- for people to follow along in a Bible. So John 10, 6 through 21. And once you're there... We'll read, I'll read out loud for you, and you can follow along. John 10, 6 through 21. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. A division occurred among those among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon and is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Let's pray again. Open our eyes, Lord. We know that it is possible, like the Jews, for us to sit in here today and miss it, to not get the point. Please don't let that happen this morning. Just let me be a channel for truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and as we're looking at this passage, this is a teaching about Jesus using the metaphor of him being a shepherd, and you, if you're a believer, being a sheep. You know that he is shepherding his sheep, and he says he's the good shepherd, so he gives the the qualitative explanation of who he is. And he also says he's a door. He uses quite a few interesting metaphors, you know, that I'm the door. And if you look at a door, and you're in a building that has only one door in and out, he says, I'm it, I'm the door in. 
and there's no other way to get in. So Jesus is pointing out the uniqueness. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus speaking. No man comes to the Father but by me. So it's a very unique way into heaven, and it's only through Christ, and not, not a popular message. People don't like the idea that there's only one restrictive way. They like the inclusion thing. Hey, there's many roads to heaven, and I'm on my religious way. You're on yours, and, and we'll get there. And Jesus flies in the face of that and says, no, I'm it. And if there was another way, believe me, I would not have come and done what I'm about to do, and that's go to the cross and pay this horrific price. We saw that when we looked at his words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the pain that he endured for you and me, he showed us there's no other way to heaven but through that propitiation. What does that word mean? We looked at that in our men's group this week. Propitiation is from 1 John chapter 2. Jesus is our propitiation. He is the appeasement of God's anger. Even the translators that simplify the Bible as much as they can to help us understand it, they use the word propitiation in 1 John 2 because that word literally means God's righteous anger satisfied pouring it out for our sin on the sinless sin bearer to take our sins away to all who believe, looking on Jesus like the Israelites when they looked at the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness, John chapter 3. They were bit by poisonous snakes, dying of, of um, the venom, sin being venom today that we have, the, the cancer of sin, we're all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus lifted up, we receive him by faith, and we too are saved. And that's why Jesus, throughout this passage, talks about salvation. You'll, you'll be saved if you believe in me. So, you know, in verse 9, he says, On the door, if anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Saved from what? We always ask ourselves that. Because that word's a cliche. Saved, I'm saved. You're saved from what? It's eternal damnation. We looked at that in Luke chapter 16, of uh, the reality of that. So, we've had a very rich study here, and this has a lot that could be said. And this is really not the main topic. But did you notice how many times in this passage, Jesus kept saying, Nobody's taking my life from me. Nobody's killing me here. I'm about to go to the cross, but you're not killing me. I'm laying it down. I have instructions from the Father doing His will. I'm laying it down. Verse 18, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. You see that? It's His sovereignty, even hanging there on the cross. You know, the meek and mild one going to the cross. Yes, He's meek. Yes, He's mild. But He's Lord at the same time. You're not killing Him. I'm not. He's laying his life down. The Romans weren't. The Jews, they thought they were. But he told them ahead of time, no, no, you're not doing this. I'm Lord of all. Anytime people worshipped Jesus and came and fell at his feet and called him Lord, he never turned them away. Look in the book of Revelation. There's often times when John would fall at the feet of an angel and start to worship, and the angel would have a conniption fit. Ah! Don't worship me. I'm just an angel. Don't call me Lord. Not Jesus. When people worshipped him, he received it because he is Lord. So Jesus is Lord even at the cross, and that's what I want you to understand from our passage. Now turn to Luke 23, 46 through 48. And this is our final word, the seven excruciating statements of Jesus from the cross. And excruciating comes from the Greek word ex out, cruciating cross, so coming out of the cross. So a suffering that was, when you say I have an excruciating headache, you're saying my head is so hurting so bad it's like being crucified. That's where our English word comes from. And that's why we're saying this is the last excruciating statement of our Savior on the cross. Painful to make, and he made it through all the physical pain. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember, it says a loud voice. And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowd that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breast. Now remember, there had been, been darkness on the earth, earth shaking. There had been Christ with these amazing statements he's making making there before them. They'd seen all this take place. The way he died was so impactful that even a rough and tough centurion looks and said, this man was sinless. He is sinless. He was innocent. So there you have our passage. Let's break it down. So a word study on this passage. 
Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. First, notice the word Father. And you'll remember that when we looked at the statement, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not the normal way Jesus addressed God, is it? It was unique there. Jesus addresses God as what? Father. They had a relationship. They had fellowship. And we discussed in our men's fellowship group the difference between an established relationship and fellowship within that established relationship. Because remember, my dad, biological dad, my dad who gave me birth and everything, he'll always be my dad. I can't change that. There's no miracle I can work. But I can break fellowship. I could take a tomato, rotten tomato, he opens the door and I throw it, hit him in the face and run away. He's still my dad, right? Biologically, but you think we're going to get along well next time I see him? No, I don't think so. And 1 John chapter 1 and 2 we looked at explains well that we can be in a relationship with God and still do things to grieve Him. Even as Paul says to the, the churches, he says, don't quench the Spirit, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He dwells in you, don't upset the Holy Spirit. It's a relationship, okay? Brothers and sisters, we are not talking about religion. Now in the, this sense that you know, we just do a bunch of things. You know, just do things that we think will please God like a bunch of robots and, you know, he'll be happy if I do this, 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 and this. Humanly speaking, we like to do that. Give me my rules. Give me my orders. Some of you have been in the armed forces. You know, hey, give me my commandments and I'll do them. But that's not the way this relationship works. We're related to him much like any other relationship in the sense that we communicate. He communicates to us. It can be... We can have struggling times if we sin like David did. David was a murderer and a, a adulterer. Even though he was a, saved by faith, he still committed horrific sins. And, and you can read about his struggle with that in Psalm 51, Psalm 32. And he repented. And that repentance was not to be saved again. You can't lose salvation. It was to restore the fellowship between David and his God. And Jesus' fellowship with God had been broken. <gasps> what? The second person of the Trinity, Jesus, is fellowship, yes. We saw it. A glimpse of it. And, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God forsook Jesus for your sins. He allowed his relationship at that point, that fellowship, to be completely devastated because God was pouring out his anger for sin on Christ. And now we see Jesus made the statement, it is what? Finished. Therefore, he's now relating to God in perfect harmony again. And he's saying, Father... Okay, no longer my God, not this distant God. He's saying, Father. Notice the contrast there, please. So that's very important. Next, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is what's called an anthropomorphism, a big word that's used in literature and among theologians, and, and it's from the Greek word. And it, with the, what it means is to assign something human characteristics that doesn't really have them. Like I could say, hey, that tree is waving its hands in the air. You know, a lot of the, the Bible is full of these kind of anthropomorphisms. Like it says, the trees of the field will clap their hands. Trees don't have hands. But it's an anthropomorphism. It's giving a human quality to a tree. And, and what I want to point out to you is, is God doesn't have hands necessarily. He invented hands. He created it. But he became a man through Christ who had literal hands. But God, whenever these references are made, he is beyond his own creation of the human body. It's a analogous, it's saying here that we're under his control, that we, you know, hands are used to express powerful grasp, control, and what I want you to get here, not to be too technical, but the whole point in this is that this is explaining to us that Jesus is submitting himself here at death into the very hands, into the control, the grasp, the hollow of the hands of God, and he uses that anthropomorphism of God the Father. And I know that's a little mind-boggling because often, you know, we're humans. We think of everything in, in physical senses. But as you really get deep into the Scripture and you study you know, about God Himself, He says, I'm not like you. <laughs> I made you. But we don't know exactly what He looks like is, you know, and, and how He exists. We know He says He's a spirit. And He's manifest Himself through the God-man, Jesus Christ. But I wanted to point that out to you. And also the, the main point here, okay, that we not miss the main point. Jesus is defining His immediate destiny. You've heard of soul sleep. What is soul sleep when people say, ah, you know, soul sleep? Any definition you want to give for soul sleep? Okay, soul sleep is where people say, you know, you die and your soul just kind of 
like sleeps there for a while until God decides what to do with you at some point. There's a lot of religions that have that idea that you could categorize under that. There's a purgatory idea. Islam has this outer darkness idea where you go into this place called Jahannama. And you stay there in this dark place of fire until you've paid enough and you come out. And that's not really soul sleep. It's like a purgatory payment. Non-biblical idea. Well, Jesus is saying here that um, he is going immediately into the control of his God, his Father. And turn to 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. And let's look at a cross reference here. You hear me quote this, but I want you to look at it in black and white today. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Therefore... Being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So that is the principle you hear often people say, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that's exactly the case. That's what Paul teaches. There's no holding tank or temporary place it's immediate and jesus is saying here i'm laying my life down father as you told me nobody's taking it from me here's the moment now he's depositing and let's go to our next word here i commit into your hands i commit my spirit so jesus look at those words i that's jesus laying it down no one taking it from him sovereign control commit and that word commit means to place alongside to present or to deposit Think of that image there, a deposit. So Jesus is there laying his life down. He's depositing that spirit there with the Father. And we see his control and the immediacy of of him going right into heaven. And the last words we'll look at is my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. His spirit leaves his body and goes immediately into the presence of his Father in heaven. And look at uh, Luke 16, 22 through 23. And we're going to break into a passage we extensively looked at a few weeks ago. And it's the passage of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man who went immediately to hell when he died. And Jesus tells this parable. Tells this story about the rich man going immediately to hell and the poor man immediately to heaven. And it's beautiful because so many people think there's going to be a waiting and holding tank. And never does Scripture teach that. Now, the poor man died... And was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Immediate heaven for the poor man that was saved. The rich man, unsaved, also died and was buried. And in Hades, or hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. See the immediacy of this? So Christ, when he makes this statement, is underlining and punctuating just how immediate salvation is and condemnation, as we saw from Luke chapter 16. And that's an important point to understand. So there we have broken down the passage. Now, at the end of each message, we come to these applications. What is Jesus teaching us from this excruciating statement from the cross? What is the point of this? I want to point out to you, among other things, three points. Number one, enjoy your relationship and your fellowship with your God. And you can turn to 1 John 1, nine, And this is a passage we looked at with the men's fellowship group and spent a lot of time discussing it. I'll just quote it to you. You can look it up or make a note. It says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you look at the context, John is talking to Christians very clearly. He's talking to believers from the context. And so what do you mean confess and forgive sins? I thought that was done one time forever for every believer. It is. When we are justified, declared righteous by God, our sins are completely wiped out. Past, present, in future, it has to be that way, or we could have no fellowship with the living God. What is being discussed here is that fellowship, you know, that thing of we throw a tomato in God's face, quench and grieve the spirit. And we come and say, Lord, I'm, I agree with you. Confess is the, the Greek word homo legao. Homo means the same. Lego to say, to say the same. So when you confess your sin, you are saying, I agree, Lord. I agree that what you said about whatever sin it might be is exactly right, and I repent of breaking that. That's what confession is, and the fellowship is restored. So we want to enjoy, like Jesus, that relationship and fellowship. Don't get all caught up in the externals. You know, the, We're going to do the Lord's Supper, and we're here listening to the Bible and all that, and, and they're important. But they're not the core of it. It's a heart issue of understanding the meaning behind this and, and why you're doing it. 
And because you're relating to your God as you would any relationship in a sense. Like think of stepping into your house, like stepping into church and trying to relate to your wife often like you relate to God, you know. How cardboard and stale that could be. You know, do you sing to God? Do you worship Him? Do you praise Him? As you're walking down the road, <clears throat> let's take Jim, for example, this RV decision. You're walking down the road. You know, would you be worrying about your RV decision? Or you say, hey God, I'm worrying about my RV decision here. But I know you love me. I know you'll show me. I really want to, you know, I just want to do what's right here. And you know, you're, you're praying in your heart and just think, Lord, help me. And, and I love you, Lord. And glorify your name through me. You know, that's a whole different scenario, isn't it, than, than just kind of, you know, approaching it some other way. That's why I appreciated, you know, Jim's heart this morning sharing about something that seems as banal or mundane as, you know, that kind of decision, saying, I want to glorify God in this. And that's what we want to say here. Enjoy your relationship and your fellowship with God. Through Christ. You say, well, this is foreign to me. And, and I think it is often when I got saved too, I didn't know how to sing. You know, I went through the motions, I sang hymns and all that, but I mean really sing to God. It was in college groups where we sang choruses. I learned to open my heart up and say, you know, I, I really love God. I love you, Lord. To sing to Him. And you can be on your own. You may not be a rock star in the way you can sing, but when you sing your joyful noise before God, all heaven is glorified, and God loves when we praise Him. That's one way to, to enjoy Him, is sing to Him. Maybe you haven't learned to sing to God. I encourage you, that's one way to do it. The second principle I want to point out to you is cultivate the same supreme confidence that Jesus had in the face of death. I want to ask you this question. Can you face death right now? You're, just say something would happen on your way home from church, and you're in an accident, and you have two minutes left, and, and there the EMT is over you. He's pumped your heart a bit, and you got, you're barely back, and you have a couple of minutes, and you're facing going into eternity. Would you have that same supreme confidence that Jesus had? Because He's there about to die. He's Father. <laughs> Father. This is a relationship, not God, but Father. Into your hands, you know, I commit my spirit. Stephen did this. He wasn't the Christ. When he was martyred, he committed himself as well into God's hands. And do you have that supreme confidence? And by that, I don't mean self-confidence. I mean a confidence that's rooted Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So how do you develop supreme confidence in your faith? So faith comes through what? Hearing. hearing. And how does hearing come? Through the, word. through the word of God. In other words, we hear God's word and it's talking about not just going in our ears like it did the Jews in one ear and out the other. You can do that this morning. It's talking about an obedient hearing. You hear it, you're like the man that builds his house on the rock, unlike the man that built his house on the sand. The man that built his house on the rock, it's Jesus says, he hears my word and he obeys it. The storm comes, the rains fall, and his life stands at the judgment. Not like the man that built his house on the sand, Matthew 7, Jesus tells us, he says, the man that built his house on the sand was the man who heard God's word and went in his ears. He hears it. Jesus says that he hears it, but he doesn't obey it. And so that's a key principle. When you hear God's word, you're reading God's word, you hear it with believing faith, then you have faith which makes you strong and gives you that confidence. Faith comes by obeying, hearing God's word. Third principle, remember that your friends all have an eternal spirit destined for either heaven or hell. And we looked at that in Luke 16. And I challenge you, if you weren't here with us the week that we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus from Luke 16, read it. Read it again and again. Read it prayerfully. Read it backwards, forwards, inside out. You know, it's a passage that shows Jesus pulling back the curtain of heaven and hell with specific people. And one even names. He gives... A name and a face. So, I want to challenge you to read, to read through that. And so, the exhortation here is this. That as you walk through life today, you're going to be eyeball to eyeball with perhaps dozens of people. You're going to come across people here and there. And people you work with, every single one of them has an eternal destiny according to Jesus. And, you know, there's some that joke and say there's two kinds of people in this world. Those that divide all the world into two kinds of people, and those that don't. <laughs> and, you know, people mock at that a bit. You know, it's kind of a, a mocking, because as Christians, yes, 
Bible is black and white. That really is the case. We do divide people into the believers and unbelievers. Read the book of 1 John if you want evidence, substantiation. He's the black and white apostle. He sees everything in black and white. The righteous, unrighteous, the believer, the unbeliever, the saved, the unsaved. So Jesus said there's two roads, one broad road that is leading to destruction and a narrow road leading to heaven. And he says that we're all on one of those. And so as you look at people in their eyes, remind yourself, say, you know, when Jesus died on that cross, he committed his spirit to his Father and went immediately to heaven. Not everyone will be like that because there are those that will not listen to him, the reason he came and did this very work on the cross. And ask yourself the question, where are they going? I challenge you, every face you look into this week, will you do this for homework? Just ask this simple question. wonder where they're going. Their last day is coming at some point. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, what? The judgment. So it's very important to remember that people are heading to those destinies. So ask yourself, you know, where are they going? Heaven or hell? And then the next question to ask yourself is, what can I do to proclaim truth to them and maybe the answer is nothing right now there's a lot of people we can't step into their lives that the timing's not right but maybe through your prayer asking lord what can i do to help them maybe he's going to open a door because he'll look down and say ah huh, i've been waiting hello I've been waiting for you to ask me that i remember so many times in my evangelism being with taxi drivers or I can tell you all these times, people working, cleaning windows in my apartment or sitting on a a surfboard out in the ocean, looking at somebody and saying, Lord, do you want me to witness to them? And I am blown away at how the answer comes back so many times. Not every time. Many times it comes, is yes, I'm waiting on you. It's about time is kind of the, the sense I get. I remember watching this guy on a surfboard when I was a surfer, dude, and on the coast of North Carolina, I was sitting out on my board. You sit up like that, and you know, you're know you kind of up above the water waiting for waves. And he, we start drifting together, and I've been praying this. And there we were, sitting way out in the, the ocean on our surfboards. And I witnessed to him. He accepts Christ on his surfboard. Tan body, long blonde hair, cool dude. Accepted Christ right there. Another time, a guy washing the window. And I go over, and I'm chatting with him. Lead him to Christ as he's washing the window. You know, these people were ready to believe to accept the Lord. And, and sitting in a taxi, I remember sitting back there, I was worn out, heading between Africa and America somewhere in a, this limousine taxi. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to witness to anybody. I'm tired. Please don't let this guy talk to me. And then I was convicted. What if this is his only chance? And I said, okay. All right, Lord, I'd like a break, but if you want me to say something, then show me. And immediately the guy starts engaging me in conversation. And he starts talking about, he's a Krishna involved in reincarnation. He's an American that got into all these strange things and and, uh, didn't lead him to Christ, but sure had a great opportunity. So that's what I want to say to you folks is if you begin asking that question, praying that prayer, let's just watch and see what happens this week. And there will be probably a a lot of opportunities where you'll just look in their eyes and walk away and you'll say, well, Lord, plant a seed in that person's life as they walk away. Would you do that this week? Let's try that. Experiment. Just see if that heart of Jesus that has paid that, this excruciating price for you on the cross and told us to go into the nation, see if he will open doors for you and your friends, your co-workers. All right, well, let's close in prayer, and in a minute we're going to sing, and we're going to do the Lord's Supper, so I've kind of abbreviated our message today. Let's pray together.